So I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. <clears throat> Do you think you're going to be able to deliver the whole message tonight? Sorry. Welcome to Foundational Bible Teachings. You're an animated dirt bag on two legs. You're living because of God's mercy. You still don't understand that. I'd like to welcome everybody to tonight's Bible study. And uh, I am so happy that I'm doing Bible study tonight. Before we get started, let's pray. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam noten veshomer gvarech lelamed leadrichut leonhot otanu vederek sheba aleinu lelechet aleidet perhat aneinu ozaninu vilevno leman himsor lanu lmirachmatech hediatra udvunatech veniret niflaot mitoratra sherwa hakodesh shalachat anchet kolanu el kol ahemet berechet limud emilash elecha b'shem Yeshua. Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, giver and preserver of your word. Teach, instruct, and guide us in the way we should go by opening our eyes, our ears, and our hearts, that you may impart to us of your wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, that we may behold wondrous things out of your law. May your Holy Spirit guide us into all truth. Bless the study of your word in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen. Last week we were looking at vile affections, and uh, today we're going to continue on that theme. The question I asked last week was, but I thought God was merciful that He just wouldn't abandon you. Now, God is merciful. God literally waits for the last minute, hoping that man would turn from his sinful and wicked ways. He's waiting. He's sending you signs. He's trying to pull you back ever so softly, ever so gently. And that's the way God operates in our lives. When man doesn't turn from his wicked ways, and God sees there's nothing more that anybody can do, including himself, to turn man from his wickedness, judgment is the next thing that these people will face. By wickedness, I mean departure from the rules of divine law. Evil disposition or practices, immorality, crime, sin, sinfulness, corrupt manners, wickedness generally signifies evil practices. Now here's two examples of God's judgment to whom He gave unto their vile affections, uncleanness and a reprobate mind. Now please notice God's patience with man and how long He waits until He snaps. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. Here we're going to be looking at Noah and the flood in Genesis chapter 6. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now God waited here to the utter end, and then He destroyed them. He waited till everybody passed and crossed that line. Now this is what God does to you, by the way. He tries to pull you back with all the signs that He sends you through the hearing, through your sight, through your touch, your feelings, whatever it could be. It could be a book, TV program, it could be radio, pro it could be whatever. And God is gently saying, don't go that way or do this. Because God knows what's good for you. I'll tell you a story. I was treated like a very, very bad father. I lived on a very busy boulevard. I've seen cars basically riding on the sidewalk. So I told my children, when you come outside to play, you see the sidewalk, I want you two feet, which is approximately this distance. If I see you within this two feet buffer, you're coming back inside and you're going to be seeing summer from inside the house. One lady came to find out about it. I never had somebody not scream at me, but really tell me off. What kind of a father are you? You're so mean, you're so this, you're so that. So I let her talk and I says, well, I have one question for you. You know the street over here? Yeah. You see how crazy they drive? Yeah. You've seen them drive on the sidewalk? Yeah. And I'm going to have my children basically play on the sidewalk. Are you feeling good? Did not know what to say after that. As a father knows what's best for the children. My father knows what's good for me. At the age that I'm at, with all the experience I've got, I screw up. He knows that. And he gently guides me. Every once in a while, I get to shut him back at the head. I says, okay, I got that one. Because I got the signs and I'm still not listening. I still have a hard head sometimes. With my children, it's the same thing now. I tell my children what the boundaries are. Not because I hate them. It's because I love them. All the laws that you find in the Bible, it's because he loves you. He wants you to stay clear from some of these evils. If something might look evil, don't even go there. Don't even take a chance. The commandments that you find in the Bible, it's there for our good. It's there for God to protect us. It's not there because God has nothing to do in heaven and says, let me see, how can I make their lives miserable now? God doesn't operate like that. When he says no fornication, no adultery, no uncleanness, no gossip, no hatred, variance, emulations, right, strife, seditions, whatever it is, there's a reason for that. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. Another one in Ephesians. There's a reason for that. 
In Ephesians 4.26 it says, Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. You want to freak out? You want to have anger? Not a problem. God says, I don't have a problem. Make sure you don't sin in your anger. But He also gives you a time limit. Before the sun goes down, you better make sure that you're going to go to bed with a clear mind. That's what He's saying. You want to get angry? You want to have wrath? Not a problem. Let it come out. Make sure that you're not sinning in the process. But He also gives you a time limit. This is something that I've done for myself and man does it work. Going to bed with a clear free mind? I got a problem with you, with anybody, I'm going to come and deal with you before the sun goes down. What about a spouse? What about a child? What about a mother, father, aunt, cousin, neighbor, whatever it is? So when he put that in there, it's not because he wants to make our lives miserable. He wants to make sure that we're going to live a nice, happy, joyous, harmonious life. That's why he said all those commandments and those rules and regulations that people, I can't become a Christian. Oh no, there's too many rules and regulations. Well, you know what? Keep wallowing in your mud like a pig and just go out there and have fun. But then what's going to happen to you? Your life is going to be in a shambles. You're going to be coming undone at the seams. But the minute that you've got something that actually covers you, like I told my children, stay away from the sidewalk. Why did I do that? Because I know that there could be a nut coming down the street and they might mow one of my kids over. And then what? That's what God did for you. That's why we have those rules and regulations. So to get back to what I was saying, God waits to the utter end in these people's lives in Genesis chapter 6, in your life also. And then He basically comes in, leaves you over to a reprobate mind. That usually is going to lead you to death because for the destruction of the flesh, whatever sin you're into, it is going to consume you. Now He will send you all kinds of signs like I was saying to show you that you're headed the wrong way. But if you act as if you don't see those signs or you willfully ignore them, God says not a problem because we are free moral agents. By being free moral agents, you can do whatever you want. But remember, you're coming to a judgment, saved or lost. Now, He'll send you many more to the point when He sees in your heart that you will not of your own free will take heed or repent of your ways. Your judgment is right around the corner. There was no more goodness in man in Genesis chapter 6. Everything he thought was only evil continually. Every imagination, that is, all of his thoughts were rotten to the core. That's where man had reached. Verse 6, And it repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. Now, by the way, the word repent here means from the Merriam-Webster dictionary, to repent, the second definition, to change one's mind. So, in the fourth definition, applied to the Supreme Being, it's to change course of providential dealings. When God was grieved, He was going to change His ways with man. Question, to what did He change His mind to, or change the course of His providential dealings? Verse 7, And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from off the face of the earth. That's the turn that He took. Evil continually in their hearts, I'm going to destroy them now. Both man and beast and a creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for He repenteth me that I have made them. So God changed His mind and would destroy man from off the face of the whole earth. It does not mean God regretted that He had created man. Many people think that when God grieved, they think that, oh, I feel sorry, I shouldn't have done. No, no, no. Get the proper definitions. Words have many definitions. Get the proper definition of that word in a context, in a sentence in which it's built in. Again, repent here is to change one's mind, and this is what God did. So basically, God was about to can, or end, the man project until something happened. Look at verse 8. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Because of Noah, God decided to continue this man project. God would only spare Noah and his family from this judgment that's basically eight people. Noah, his wife, his three boys, and their wives. Verse 11, The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. And God looked upon the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted his way upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. So Noah and his family were exempted from this particular judgment. He waited to the utter end, but then there was a family of eight people. They never crossed that line, and God knew that they were not going to cross that line. Noah finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. He says, I'm going to protect you from the judgment I'm going to be sending on the earth. Now we're going to look at a second judgment, Sodom and Gomorrah. So turn to Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in a tent door in the heat of the day. I want you to jump down to verse 16 and 17 for those of you taking notes. A conversation ensues between the Lord and Abraham between verses 2 and 15. 
When we get to verse 16, And the men rose from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham the thing which I do? Jump down to verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which has come unto me, and if not, I will know. And the men, those angels, they turned their faces from thence and went towards Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. I want you to put a bookmark over there. And by the way, did you notice something in that last verse that we just finished reading? Abraham stood before the Lord, that is, God who is called Yahweh, Jehovah, which is the Tetragrammaton, the Y-H-W-H, that's one of God's names, who was standing in front of Abraham. Did you get that? God was standing literally in front of Abraham. He veiled himself in flesh and he was speaking with Abraham. Now compare that to John chapter 1 and verse 18. So John 1 18 says, No man hath seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. Now no one has seen God at any time. Here we're talking about the Father. Yet Yahweh is standing in front of Abraham. My understanding is it's Jesus Christ that's actually standing in front of Abraham. Now he doesn't have his fleshly body yet. This is called the Shekinah glory of God. He actually shows up veiled in flesh that Abraham was able to speak to him, see him, and whatever else. And this is Jesus Christ that's actually in front of him. So here we have Yahweh standing in front of Abraham. Yahweh, or Jehovah, however you want to call him, makes his guest appearance on earth at different times. And I'm going to cover this a little bit more in the Trinity study. Now Abraham now tests God's mercy to see how far he will go. How far, how deep is his mercy? So go back to Genesis chapter 18. We'll start reading in verse 23. And Abraham drew near and said, Will thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now this question hits the center of God's mercy. Verse 24, Preadventure. Now the word means by chance or perhaps. There be fifty righteous within the city. Will thou also destroy and not spare the place for fifty righteous that are therein? That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked, be it far from thee. Shall not the judge of the whole earth do right? And by the way, this is another verse pointing to Jesus Christ, that it was him standing in front of uh, Abraham. Again, I'm going to be covering this in the uh, Trinity study. In verse 26, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. Now, side note, the world today is being held back from destruction because of the righteous. There must have been two, three hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, let's say even a million people in Sodom, Gomorrah, and all the plain all around. There was a lot of people. If 50 righteous people would have been found, he was going to spare the place. The reason the earth is still being spared, it's because of the believers that are still around the world. I don't care what country you're in, you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you might be the only righteous person in your particular country, and you might be the one that's actually keeping that country from being destroyed. So today's righteous men and women are those who have their sins washed in the blood of the Lamb. Go to verse 27. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. Preadventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. Will thou destroy the city for lack of five? And he said, If I find forty and five, I will not destroy it. And he, speaking of Abraham, spake unto him, the Lord, yet again, and said, Preadventure, there shall be forty found there. And he said, I will not do it for forty's sake. And verse 30, And he said unto him, Let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Preadventure, there shall thirty be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find thirty there. And he said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. Preadventure, there shall twenty be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for twenty's sake. And he said, speaking of Abraham again, Well, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak yet this once. Preadventure, ten shall be found there. Always speaking of righteous people. And he, the Lord said, I will not destroy it for ten's sake. You'll find God's mercy is very, very great. If ten people would have been found in Sodom and Gomorrah, those cities which were basically all around, those two cities would have been around today. That's how great God's mercy is. You're an animated dirt bag on two legs. You're living because of God's mercy. You still don't understand that. God doesn't exist. You like to drink, you like to take it up, whatever it is that you're basically into. And God has mercy on you. You curse Him, you swear at Him, and the dirty jokes and whatever else about God, Jesus Christ, in the Bible. 
Now remember, Abraham stopped at ten righteous people. My question is, if Abraham had gone down to three righteous souls, would God have spared those cities because of three? Because in the end there was Lot, there was his two daughters. I believe God's mercy is that great. If Jesus Christ had to come down this earth to die for one person, he would have done it. God's mercy is super great. I don't care what you've done in your life. I don't care what you've thought in your life. God will forgive you if you're going to go to God. Repent of your sins. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God's mercy is great. What are you waiting for to come to God? What is it that you have in your life, in your lost life right now without God, that you're hanging on to? Think about it. What is it that you have in your life? Sexual immoralities, fleshly appetites, whatever that appetite is. For those five seconds of, oh, that makes me feel nice. That it's your booze, that it's your drugs, that it's sex, whatever it is that you're actually into. You don't want to let go of that and not get eternal life? Are you feeling good? I'm going to give you another example. The context of Jonah, the people of Nineveh. The inhabitants of Nineveh, they repented of their evil ways and God spared them from destruction. And Jonah was very angry. And this is what Jonah said. Turn to Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1. And what I'm reading right now is to show you God's mercy. There must have been 120,000 people in that particular city. Jonah, because the Ninevites, they were enemies with Israel. He wanted God to destroy them. And if you know the story, he came in with eight words. He had 40 days and Nineveh will be destroyed. And what happened? On those eight word preaching, even the donkeys and their animals, they had sackcloth and ashes upon them. In Jonah chapter 4 and verse 1 it says, But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was very angry. Verse 2, And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my country? Therefore I fled before thee unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious and merciful and slow to anger and of great kindness and repentest thee of the evil. Jonah knew this about God. For some reason, in 2023, people somehow forgot about that. You're breathing because of His mercy. He's trying to pull you back. He's trying to tell you. He's trying to send you all kinds of signs. And for some stupid reason, you don't want to see, you don't want to hear. Go back to Genesis chapter 19 now in verse 13. In verse 13 it says, For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord said unto us, to destroy it, speaking of the angels. Verse 16, And while he lingered, the men laid upon, number one, his hand, and upon, number two, the hand of his wife, and upon, number three, the hand of his two daughters. They literally had to go grab him to pull him out of there. Even as a righteous person, you can get sucked into whatever sin people are in. Evil communication corrupt good manners. Who are your friends? Maybe it's time to start taking inventory. He's out, she's out. She, she, he, he, you know what? The whole gang is out. If you've got the character as one person coming into a gang and you are able to change all of their ways, keep them as friends. If you find yourself weak, that you might be sucked in to whatever they're in, get yourself out. Know who you are. So like I was saying, the Lord being merciful unto him, and they brought him forth and set him without the city. They literally had to drag them out of the city. Verse 22. Haste thee, hurry up, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore the name of the city was called Zoar. Now the Lord had mercy and long suffering on all men and giving them the time to return to him and repent of their disobedience or rebellion against God. But when they saw they kept on going, he leaves over a reprobate mind. Eventually they're going to get destroyed. The word long suffering basically means God bears injuries or provocations for a long time. He's patient, he's not easily provoked. But when man continues in his willful disobedience and rebellion against God, when God did everything in his power to keep you back, God hardens man's heart by giving him the desires of his heart. The Lord sometimes might be gently guiding you in a particular way. It could be a study, a person maybe that you should be with for the rest of your life. It could be a part of a city for where you should go live. Pray and you say, Lord, what should I do here? And you come to a fork in the road. The Lord will gently say, you know what? I would take this road if I were you. Because him being up, he knows what's at the end of these roads. And that's where you become still. That's where you meditate on God's word. You know what's coming to mind? Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. But in all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. You don't know what's happening in your life. You prayed for something. It just got shot to hell. 
But you know what? God's still in control. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. You trust in Him and He's going to guide you out of it. Sometimes it's something that you need to learn. Sometimes it's something that you need to see and basically come back out. There's somebody that you might help. Whatever it is, whatever the situation might be. But God's got everything in control. No matter what's happening in your life, if you've been saved by the blood of the Lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ, if you put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, you repented of your evil ways. You confess with your mouth believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. God gives you salvation. You become part of His family. Like it says in John 1.12, to them that believe, to them gave you power to become the sons of God. You become part of His family. As a child now, He can chastise you if you're walking crooked. But there's something else that you need to know. In Romans 8, 28 it says, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. We are still His servants. He will put you strategically in certain places. As a servant, we are still serving the Lord. Sometimes there's a word that we need to deliver someone. You know what happened to me one time? Many years ago. I got sick, ended up going to the hospital. I'm sitting there like half spaced out, sitting next to this one person, this one guy. Struck up a little bit of a conversation, ended up witnessing to the guy. He goes, that's what I needed to hear today. Did what I had to do. I came back home and I was on my knees praying. I says, God, do you have to get me that sick so I can go talk to that guy? Couldn't I met him on a bus or something? So what happened is that he got me sick to get me at that particular point. When he got me to that particular point, he got that other guy coming in. Something that I wrote about a year ago. He ended up reading what I had written on our homepage on the Foundational Bible Teachings. And he goes, wow, you guys were answering my prayers as I was reading. The guy was freaking out. And I praise the Lord for that. There's something that I wrote a year ago that it actually answered somebody's question one year later. I'm very, very happy that the Lord is using me to answer questions for you guys. So basically to conclude tonight's Bible study, as we read in Romans chapter 1, after you decide of your own free will to continue walking in your lustful carnal passions to the point of no return, I'm talking to you, at this point, God gives you up to vile affections, whatever it is that you're into, and then see where your life is going to go from there. He gives them up to uncleanness and over to a reprobate mind. For so did man choose, for so did you choose to walk in that way. God is a merciful God. He will honor your choice. What is it that you're choosing in your life? You may have a husband, you may have a wife, you may have children, parents, siblings, neighbors. Why don't you do something good for these people? Parents, do you know the best gift that you can give your children? is to love one another. When the parents, the mother and the father, they love each other, you don't know how it strengthens the children. But when you're bickering and you're fighting, and you're cursing, and you're swearing and slamming and just breaking up your house, how do you think the poor little guy is going to grow up? These people are growing up, they're looking at you, they're going to be basically emulating you. Life is short. Love, peace, joy, happiness, harmony. This is what God wants in your life. We have to pursue it. You want love, peace, joy, happiness and harmony in your life? You have to work at it. One time I was working at the bank. This one customer rattled my rat cage. I'm freaking out. The next client that comes, she was a very, very nice lady. And I was very abrupt with her, very... So she looks at me, she goes, Frank, yeah, yeah, are you okay? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. No, you're not. You're never like this when I pass at your cash. Ah, uh, you know what? I'm really sorry. The other person just rattled me and... Can I ask you a question? Oh, yeah. Because they rattled your cage, why are you taking it on the next person? Right now it's me. But maybe sometimes it might not be me, it might be somebody else. What happens if you rattle his cage and all of a sudden you get into a fist fight? Why do you let that person affect you so much that the next person is going to grab your wrath? No, no, no. Deal with this person. You know what? I'm going to the washroom, I'm going to take a drink of water, I'm going to go outside, take in a few deep breaths. Okay, we're going to reset. Come back in and put that smile back on your face. Don't let somebody else affect you. Now you're going to go and ruin somebody else's day. What a great lesson that that lady taught me. Super, super sweet lady. And if you're watching this video, I thank you for that because I became a better person for it. Remember, God throws nobody in hell. It is of your own choosing. Everybody has an opportunity to get out of the mess that they're in. God throws nobody in hell because of His mercy. This is something that you decided to do. Good for you. God says, that's where you want to go? You sure now? Are you sure? Is that your last answer? You want a lifeline. Actually, I'm going to give you 15 lifelines because your answer is dead wrong. But God slowly comes in. He shows you. At the end, says, you know what? That's what you want. That's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to stop it here for tonight. Have yourselves a good week. Lord willing, we see each other here next week.
So I have a question for you. Where will you spend eternity future? John 3.36 states, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. I want you to know that God provided the way for you to go to heaven. John 14.6 states, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now is the accepted time. Today is your day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 2 states, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You may be asking yourself, how do I get salvation? Pray to God in your own words by believing what God said about obtaining salvation. Believe in your heart, not your head, what you are saying to God. The ABCs of salvation. A. Admit you have sinned against God and confess your sins to Him for forgiveness. Romans 3 verse 10 states, As it is written, There is none righteous, no not one. Romans 3.23 states, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 1 John 1 verse 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. B. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and that God raised Jesus from the dead. Romans 5 verse 8 states, But God commandeth His love toward us, in that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 and 4 For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. C. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and call upon Him. Romans 10 verse 9 and 13 If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Remember, salvation is a free gift of God's grace. It is not of works. It is not a church membership. It is your relationship with God that created heaven and earth and everything in it. Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 state, For by grace ye are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Receive Jesus Christ and believe on his name to be a child of God. John 1 verse 12 states, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Your choice, as Israel was given the choice between life and death, even so, I now put the same before you. Deuteronomy 30 verse 15 and 19. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. Remember, Romans 6 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Acts 16 31. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved.